hi, how are you all doing? Um, I've always wanted to be on a stage where there was like the big like TED style signs. So you'll just see me going over here a little, uh, just so I can take some screen grabs later and have it as my profile picture. Um, but yeah, I um, just wanted to say thank you so much for staying in this room to listen to this talk. I'm really grateful. Um, as Luke said, I'm Betty. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Research Through Gaming. And I'm here to talk to you about surveys as digital games, so digital games as research instruments and talking about transforming the survey um, through UX and design. Um, and I've spent the last six and a half years talking about surveys, thinking about surveys. Um, you know, surveys are pretty much 99.9% um, .9 of my life, which is quite sad, but there we are. Um, but this is not a look of joy. This is actually a look of hysteria um, because I hate surveys. Um, they are so long, they are so boring. Uh, and now that I've said that, I'm going to completely um, be an awful researcher and bias your opinion because uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have taken part in a survey? Yeah, a lot of hands, okay. You've never taken part in a survey? You two here? <laughs> Maybe. It didn't have no impact on my life, um, <laughs> which is an interesting point, and I'll, I'll come to in a moment. How many of you have really looked forward to taking part in a survey? Really? She's a researcher. Okay, we'll look at there. Um, right, right. Um, so, so, yeah, um, I, I think there are a number of things wrong with the traditional survey, these tick box style surveys that you often get emailed um, online. Um, they're, you know, they're long, they're cumbersome. Um, and very often, actually, the way that the questions are worded um, don't sound very natural or very human. Um, and so um, that really impacts a lot on kind of how people perceive the survey as a product of the market research industry, which is the industry I'm part of. So I am a researcher. I work in the market research industry. And what is really, really sad is that, um, when, I mean, even if you go on Google Image, right, like, this is the face of the market research industry. Like, this is our product, okay? Um, and, you know, like, what can we see here? So some tick boxes. We can see the word survey. So such is the lack of interest in surveys that we haven't really got a visual representation for the survey apart from the word in clip art or something. And it's, it's really awful. I mean, look, it's... Um, it's relentless. I mean, look at the state of it. Um, and it's really sad because actually there are so many really interesting things going on in the market research industry. So um, there are researchers who are pioneering um, areas of behavioral economics and using that in market research. Look how I'm going over to the sign, right? Um, there are people doing loads of really cool things with neuroscience, um, evolving mobile technology for data collection. Um, the survey software industry is also evolving. Um, and people doing very interesting things around emotion and virtual reality. And there's so many cool things going on. But this guy is how we're seen. So I was like, no, um, we're not having that. Um, so just to give you a brief history of the survey as a product, okay, because I'm talking to UX designers, you're interested in designing good, usable, impactful products. So it's good to understand kind of the history of the survey. So over here is where we started, okay, so we were going door to door, we were knocking on people's doors and we're asking them questions on their doorstep with a a notepad or a clipboard and a pen and taking down responses and ticking off check boxes and things like that. And eventually that got really tiring and people wouldn't open the door. Um, and actually such is that kind of horrible feeling instilled in human beings that often when I tell people I'm a researcher, they're like, oh right, so you just go around with a clipboard, do you? It's like, no. That is not what I do. Um, but things moved on. Okay, so the second stage here, phones. We're using phones for research. This is really cool. We can actually phone people at home at uh, all hours of the day and interrupt them during their dinner and ask them questions, and then people wouldn't answer the phone anymore. Um, and we call people on their mobiles now. Okay, so, so then we kind of moved over to phones. So that was really interesting. We could do more, right? We could contact more people. And then about here the internet. We can now do those surveys and send them out to lots and lots of people um, by email, which is really cool. So everybody was very excited about that in market research. But the trouble is, is that 
how the survey looked at stage one on the clipboard door to door didn't really change when it went on the internet. It was still just basically a very linear piece of paper, but just online. Okay, so it didn't really change it very much. But here is where those cool things are really happening at this stage here, where people are utilizing different disciplines in research, and people are certainly using um, a lot more visual stimulus in surveys. So there are improvements now um, in survey software where you can have graphics and you can have video um, and things are really changing. But where I am at the moment is here. And that's not to say that I'm kind of in front of all the other really cool things that are going on. It's to say actually that, oh, and we're off. Um, it's actually to say that at that stage, I'm merging lots of those disciplines together because games inherently incorporate so many elements of psychology, of behavioral economics, of neuroscience, of emotion. So all of those things combine together. Um, oh, I'm alive again. Um, and um, later on in this presentation, I'll just touch on where things might go in the future. But for now, um, I'm going to focus on this area and just talk to you about uh, games for research, or what I call research games. Um, and how this came about is that basically I've always kind of been a designer, really an artist at heart, and I found myself working in the market research industry quite by accident, like most market researchers. Um, but every day after work, I'd go home and I'd be playing video games, and I just thought, you know, why can't the surveys that I make during the day for work be as intrinsically engaging as the games I play in the evening because I could quite easily um, be playing World of Warcraft until two in the morning and I'd be sitting there, my belly's rumbling and I'm tired, but no, I just need to get another quest done. Um, but then nobody would want to take part in the surveys that me and many other market researchers around the world are building. Um, and that's because... Um, aside from the elements of it not looking very nice and then being quite long and boring and all the rest of it, um, surveys rely on extrinsic engagement. So very often, if you've taken part in a survey, which many of you say that you have, you would have been offered some kind of reward. So it might be vouchers, it might be points that lead up to some kind of monetary reward, or it just might be cash. Um, but the trouble is with extrinsic engagement and extrinsic motivators, and we know this from academia for years now, is that extrinsic uh, motivators don't always work. They're not always infallible. Um, and also, it kind of has created a new kind of behaviour. And I say new, but it's not really. It's in the scope of the market research history, it's new. But this thing called speed, line, uh, speed running or straight lining. So people are like, oh, great. I can get some money at the end of this survey or a voucher, so I'm literally going to just answer anything just to get to the end um, because I just, I just want the money at the end. Just give me the money. Um, so of those of you who have said today that you've answered a survey, be honest, how many of you just got to a point in the survey where you just kind of answered anything? Yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. <laughs> um, but... Massive decisions are being made on the back of that data. Okay, so if, imagine if you're just like basically answering whatever to get to the end. You're not really thinking about your real true opinions or, you know, obviously the researcher at the back end somewhere is getting that data in Excel file. They send that to a client. They're making, in some cases, multi-million dollar business decisions or it might be decisions made in government or processes that affect all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. So it's actually quite bad in terms of data quality. We can't trust that data. Um, and that's really worrying. So it was time for things to change. And so I thought, why not use games as a research instrument? Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that actually it can go beyond just that intrinsic engagement level. Because at first, that's what my priority was. Like, let's communicate with other human beings better through the survey, right? Let's just engage them more. That was like my first agenda. But then after doing more research and experiments and just reading up on games in an academic way um, and obviously doing more research, playing games, yeah, research, um, 
I started to see other benefits of using games. So, for example, everybody has a really bad memory. Okay, maybe one or two exceptions, but most people don't have great memories. And often, research asks you to be retrospective. How was your trip to ASDA? How did you find the UX conference? Did you enjoy the food? Um, which speaker did you think was the best? Um, you know, it's all very retrospective about what you did, what you felt, what you bought, why you did it, okay? But our memories are really bad. And if we're just looking at something that looks like a piece of paper on a screen, there's nothing really there to stimulate our recall. So, what games are really good at doing, um, digital games that are quite visual, is that we could use those digital components inherent in games to have state-dependent recall. Um, which basically means is if I'm trying to find out what um, somebody did in a supermarket yesterday, I want to know about the things that they bought, why not create like a virtual supermarket environment, make that as a game that's intrinsically engaging, and try to use that stimulus to stimulate somebody's memory. Um, and then I got to thinking, actually, it can go even further than that. We can use those visuals, we can use these games to observe behaviours in context. So rather than just asking questions, actually we can just watch what people do in games. And if any of you have played any kind of um, game, you'll, you'll know that that is absolutely um, within our reach, technology-wise, um, data collection-wise. Um, but not only can we observe those um, behaviours and choices in context, but we can also try to understand some of those emotions that drive those choices. So we're not just talking about state-dependent recall, we're talking about state-dependent choices and emotions. So let's say you're in the supermarket and I'll, I'll start to talk to you about what you will do in the future. So suddenly research is not retrospective anymore. Suddenly we're talking to people about what they might do in the future, and that is far more valuable to businesses in the modern day than retrospective data, because you can't really change what people did yesterday and what that means, although it's very useful. What businesses are more interested in now is what people are likely to do tomorrow. So suddenly, we're talking about a transformation of research, not just in retrospective versus future gazing, but also in creating simulations where you can understand how different emotional contexts, um, different stimulus can drive different behaviours and choices. So for example, you're in a supermarket. What about a simulation A, where you have um, an unlimited budget to spend, your behaviour and choices will change. Um, what about simulation B? You suddenly have a very limited budget. Now I'm observing what you'll buy and what your behaviour will be based on that. What about simulation C? Um, you have an average budget to spend, but now you're late for a doctor's appointment. You have 10 minutes to do your shopping and you have a screaming child in the trolley. Okay, so all of these experiences in the real world shape what you do all of the time. As logical as we think we are, behavioural economics tells us that we're irrational. So trying to recall this stuff in a survey is really, really difficult. So we place people there, we put them in simulations. So now actually it's another level. We start talking about predictive modelling. We can tell businesses that from the data we see from these simulations, we can see that if this element of um, stimulus is in place, or if people have a certain type of budget, or if you put this marketing campaign here versus there, or if you produce this product versus this product, if you have this kind of packaging versus this kind of packaging, this is what people are likely to do and likely to buy. So that becomes more interesting for people. Um, so at this point, you're probably wondering, well, what do one of these research games look like? Um, so this is a screen grab from a very old research game. Um, actually, this is probably um, something that I designed 
four, four and a half years ago on behalf of an academic study. Um, this is called TESA Undercover Agents. TESA stands for the Elite Secret Service Agency. And the whole, um, the whole point of the study was to understand different taboos and desires around how people identify and authenticate who they are. And what that means is, basically, they wanted to know, well, how does your laptop know who you are? How does your phone know who you are? When you go into a place of work, how does the building know who you are? Um, if you were to go to the airport but you've lost your passport, what would you use instead as a form of ID? What would you be willing to do? Or what kind of maybe technology like an RFID implant would you be willing to go ahead with? So all of this obviously dealt around themes of identity and also some situations that would be quite stressful. So if you did lose a passport and you had to think on your feet for another form of identity and your plane's about to go and you've got people waiting behind you, it's a stressful situation. So Tessa Undercover Agents put people in a role play where they were an undercover agent that deals with themes of identity, that links in with the research content, and through four different missions had to capture Agent Nort, who is this guy here. He's actually my mate Carl, um, but here he is as Agent Nort. Um, and so everything about this, literally every colour and font and pixel, just everything here has a function. Everything has been designed to meet those research objectives for those business needs for the academic um, studies needs so the whole you know characterization the narrative the role play the missions the rewards that were narratologically relevant all of that was linked to try and find out what people would think and feel and do in certain situations where they had to identify and authenticate themselves um, and just th things like giving people rewards for completing a certain mission those rewards will help them in upcoming missions so this is now those intrinsic motivators so although they might get an incentive at the end actually participants have said that they absolutely love um, these kind of in-game rewards even though they have no kind of tangible effect on their real life um, and so just as an example of kind of maybe how one of these like levels play out so um, at one point in the research game, you have to stop Agent Nort leaving the country. So you're in his secret hideout. And on the table, there are a multitude of items. And you're tasked to take the items from Agent Nort that you think would stop him leaving the country. So while this is a very, very conceptual, okay, very metaphorical, actually we're finding out through this narrative what the person taking part is deeming as important as a form of identity that you couldn't live without. Um, now, obviously, if this was a traditional survey, it would be likely a, a grid or a drop-down menu with radio buttons and tick boxes. But so this is visual now. This is contextual. And, you know, I had some music and sound effects going on that added to that sense of urgency. I'm really trying to create that kind of, like, almost stressful environment without upsetting the participants, obviously, to try and see how that emotion and context drives behaviour and choice. Um, so the, my client, Professor Lisbeth Van Zunen, who's a wonderful woman, an academic, um, ended up sharing the data um, with um, certain relevant governmental institutions in the US and in the UK, and here she is at the Houses of Parliament talking about that. And the reason I'm telling you this is not to be like, look how cool my, my work is, but more to say that actually in market research there's been such a pushback about using games because games are seen as market, by market researchers in the majority as very frivolous and superficial and a waste of time. And research is very serious and has to be taken seriously. And, you know, and this is a really great example of how actually a game can be used for something serious, can be spoken about on a governmental level, can actually help academics have insight into people's thoughts and ideas and worries and desires. Um, so the second research game that came out of that was Dubious. And again, as you can see here, um, just kind of different storyline. Now we're talking about asking people to imagine um, how they might identify and authenticate who they are in the future. Um, and through, again, three different levels, they're tasked to do different things. And we're finding out the kind of the truth about how they think and film what they will do through those, through those uh, levels. Um, but some of my research games have also been very different. It might be 
I'm working for, um, the majority of my work is working with Fortune 500 brands. Um, this one, for example, is with the VF Corporation for their Lucy Activewear brand. Just trying to find out what the desires and preferences were around their activewear bottoms, um, which was quite a cool study, very different. And my background is in fashion, so this was really interesting for me. Um, and so because this was visual, we could take advantage of that as researchers to have the participants see their ideal yoga pants come to life. And that then gave the team insights to go ahead and actually put the most popular designs on their website as soon as two weeks after. So that was really cool to see. Um, other research games I've made for universities or whatever, they might be more quiz style. So it really all just depends on who the client is, what their business needs are, what the research objectives are, and who the audience is. Um, we also use an, um, an avatar creator tool. Um, so that's a really nice way of people letting um, us know about who they are. Again, without the drop-down menu, they can actually build their avatar and then see their avatar in the game, and that adds to their engagement with the character and that kind of emotional connection, which is important. Um, but also, again, it just transforms the survey, right? Because, again, these choices would be drop-down menu items, and now they can see what things are um, through what we call our hover-and-learn function. They can just find out what these things are, what some terminologies are. And these are just functions that are inherent in games that you don't really think about, but surveys don't have. Surveys might have questions where you don't really know the meaning of a certain word, and there's no way within the survey to just look it up. Just really simple things like that are now incorporated in games. Um, this is a screenshot from um, a, um, uh, a game we made, um, actually the first game I designed. Um, for Immediate Media, who I believe are here. This is just when they were like BBC magazines and transitioning. Um, and they wanted to know, amongst many other things, um, which celebrities were most recognisable to, to seven to ten-year-old children, uh, basically, so they know who could put, they put on the front cover of their magazines. Um, so again, we thought, well, rather than give these kids a photograph of Justin Bieber and say, do you recognise him? Yes, no, don't know. We thought, okay, make that in itself. Again, so you've got three lives. If you get it wrong, you lose a life, you have another life. Um, but actually, this is where we can gain insight that traditional surveys can't. Because not only were we, were we able to understand who was most recognisable, but actually, who else was top of mind? Because even if they got it wrong and they guessed some, another celebrity, we still actually got to know like who are these kids thinking about. So that is data that you wouldn't have had in a traditional survey. So that was really useful for, for immediate media at the time. Um, but other things that are inherent in games, like personalization. Um, you don't get that often in traditional surveys. Um, but in research games I make, I very often give the opportunity for the part participant um, to give feedback. Um, very often we are um, including a message maybe from somebody who's within uh, our client's team, in this case the president of the Lucy brand, Laurie Etheridge, um, just to kind of let them know what's the purpose of this, right? What is the purpose of this research? What's going to happen? out of this data and to thank them, like honestly, personally, thank them for their time, which is again, something you don't often get in market research surveys, that kind of level of personalization and um, transparency. Um, but games are also important because they change the interaction. So we're not taking part in surveys now, we're playing research games and play amongst children and amongst adults has shown, it's a massive area of academia, so I'm really sorry I'm whittling it down to three points here, but, but play boosts creativity and collaboration, stimulates the mind, and increases our ability to problem solve. And where, more than in research, do we want people to do all of this stuff for us? We have business problems. We're asking the populace to help us solve them. And to do that, we need their creativity. We need them to be stimulated. We need their collaboration because we want them to tell us, what do you think we should do with this product? What do you think we should do with this process? What do you think should be improved about this service? You are always problem solving for us in surveys. So play encourages that. Um, and people really enjoy the experience. I'm not going to read all the feedback here, but our play spondence, um, 
of all the feedback that they give us, the most popular term is thank you. Um, I just think they're just so grateful not to have another boring survey. Um, but yeah, it's really great to have their feedback, which I learn from. So there's things that I do wrong as a designer that I try to improve upon. Um, for example, there was one game where I had music and sound effects, but no mute button. So people were like, please include a mute button next time. And I was like, okay, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, there's things I get wrong, but I learn from that. Um, and so because now this is a playful experience, and this is intrinsically engaging, it is a research experience rather than just taking part in a survey. And it should be an experience because real life is experiential. So research should reflect that. Um, in the future, I'm really hoping for uh, narration and voice recognition in my research game. So th for those who are hard of hearing and hard of sight, I want them to take part as well. Um, so they can understand, obviously, what's going on in the research game far more easily and be able to give their feedback far more easily as well. Um, but I'm also hoping for more research game designers. I'm, I want this methodology to be used more. So more people experimenting this, with this on a design level would be really cool. Um, so now I'm really happy when I talk about surveys because I talk about them as games, um, so much so that um, a publisher called Kogan Page asked me to write about it and uh, just shameless plug here, my book Games and Gamification in Market Research will be published in November 2018 for anybody who's interested in the methodology and wants to learn more. Um, so thank you for letting me share this um, and thank you for uh, the UX Live organisers for inviting me to your big event. Thank you very much. Thank you.